evening and welcome back. Um, a warm greeting from studio in Berlin. The last panel has unpacked quite a number of issues, uh, past the present. Strategy, or lack thereof, short-term thinking versus long-term thinking, carrots versus sticks. But most importantly, the question of diagnosis and identity versus identity politics. And I was thinking how to consolidate that conversation and to transition to our next panel, uh, which is on the rule of law. And in came a statement by President-elect Joe Biden on the 25th anniversary of the Dayton Peace Accord that was put out by his transition team. So I would like to quote uh, a sentence from that statement, which I think transitions us beautifully into the next panel, and which also reflects statements of some of our panelists that had just um, finished. Too often, we have <clears throat> too often we have seen nationalism win out over national interest, and the enrichment of a few coming before reforms to benefit the many. And I'm very grateful to President-elect Biden for echoing, in fact, the observations made on the previous panel by Sabina Trudic and Jim O'Brien, which give a proper diagnosis of a problem which is too often seen as an issue of identity and identity differences rather than an issue of manipulation of that identity for short-term political goals. And the question for the EU, which has really made rule of law its priority in 14 requirements for Bosnia to kind of proceed in accession negotiations, is when are we going to stop treating the problems as problems of identity divisions and start treating them as issues related to the rule of law. And there's no one better suited to introduce this panel um, than someone who herself, in fact, works every day from Budapest to highlight the breaches of the rule of law in one of the European member states. Valerie Hopkins, who is Southeastern Europe correspondent for Financial Times. Valerie, I hand over to you and you can introduce our brilliant panel. Thank you very much, Maida. It's an honor to be here with you today and to speak with such a distinguished panel about the role that rule of law plays as the foundation, not only for peace, but as Baroness Helic said in her keynote, the future prosperity of the country. I just wanna briefly set the scene before I introduce our panelists and, and get into the conversation. I think probably most of you who are logged in today are, are pretty aware of uh, the current situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina regarding rule of law, but um, uh, I think it's important just to, to set the stage and say that recent attacks on the rule of law and on the judicial institutions in the BIH, which were established in the early 2000s, have generated an important set of challenges for the stability of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, as we touched upon in the first panel. Um, at that time, you know, the prospect of EU integration was believed to be a primary driver for the consolidation of democracy and all that comes with it. Uh, the energy of 15 years ago has been challenged by the sometimes glacial pace of reform in the region, by pressing challenges within the EU itself, as Maida already touched on, and also, of course, by enlargement fatigue. Since 2006, when the US, EU, and the Office of the High Representative abandoned their proactive approach to monitoring and promoting reforms in BIH, uh, the country's nationalist leaders have begun reversing the progress that was previously made on the rule of law reform agenda, uh, something that we still see right now. Uh, this has introduced quite a lot of political instability, since attacks on the state-level judiciary have often been accompanied by demands for greater autonomy and threats of secession. In reality, the goal behind these threats has been to bargain with the international actors and remove the elements of an independent judicial oversight at the central level of government, including international prosecutors and judges for organized crime and corruption from the BIH court, and now a more active discussion over the presence of three international judges in the constitutional court. In its 2018 strategy for the Western Balkans, the European Commission made rule of law one of its top priorities. 
But two years later, the country is still lagging on the three key priorities, reducing corruption, tackling organized crime, and establishing a well-functioning judiciary. In fact, the country performed better on these indicators in the early 2000s than it does today. A report last year by a former EU official, Reinhard Priebe, described Bosnia's judicial system as being perceived as a center, and I'm quoting, of unaccountable power in the hands of persons serving the interests of a network of political patronage and influence. That's the end of the quote. And um, so I hope that in the hour and a half ahead, we can really discuss these problems and challenges, as well as the potential for synergies between the local champions of the rule of law and their external supporters, who we have also on the panel today. I think Dr. Ruge has assembled some of the best possible people to speak on these issues. Um, we have with us Austria's Justice Minister, Alma Zadic, who is a Bosnian-born Austrian lawyer and politician from the Green Party. We have Stephen B. Heinz, the President and CEO of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, which is very active in the Balkans. Um, and we are also joined by Fred Rakojevic, who is one of the founders of Nasha Stranka, or Our Party, and since 2015, one of its presidents. Um, he also had two mandates in the local assembly of Canton Sarajevo and in the House of Peoples of the Bosnian Parliament. And we will also be hearing um, as respondents from Fiola von Kramon, a member of the European Parliament from the Group of the Greens, and last but not least, from the head of the EU delegation in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Johann Sattler, who um, has been head of the EU delegation since 2019 and previously served as Austrian ambassador to Albania, uh, which also um, where he also dealt with a lot of rule of law issues. So I want this panel to be as lively and interactive as possible. Um, I would ask that we keep initial remarks to a maximum of five minutes, um, and then we can sort of get into a more free-flowing discussion, maybe even a debate. Um, and I want to remind the audience that I will not uh, abuse my position as moderator. Please submit your questions. I will be very happy to incorporate them into the discussion. Um, so I thought we could start uh, by talking about the primary rule of law conundrums in BIH and the region and why they matter from, from each of the perspectives of the speaker. So, Mr. Tkojevic, maybe you could start by talking about your experience with state capture and um, problems with the functioning of rule of law across BIH. And uh, what are the consequences for stability and for peace? And can you, yeah. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, it's a great honor to be in this panel, and I listened to the panel before, and it was really informative and interesting, and uh, obviously it takes time to realize the mistakes that were made, and I'm glad that people who made those mistakes now think that, that today, with this hindsight, they would do maybe a different kind of thing for Bosnia. Because what I think was the fundamental issue from Dayton Agreement and the one that we are talking today, 25 years after, is that Dayton is a constitution that was created for a country with special needs. And Bosnia has been treated as a country with special needs for 25 years, and it's kind of uh, almost uh, starting to accept that status, even though it doesn't uh, really qualify, qualify for that. Bosnia and Herzegovina is a European country our culture, our background, our, all our previous lives. We are European country. Anyway, back to your question. The rule, the rule of law is really a prerequisite to the development of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and it's crucial for its uh, road to what I think are our last and best hope, as uh, Europeans used to call America, uh, uh, to, to join EU and to join NATO in, in the end. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that for anybody here, the abundant corruption in Bosnia, the, the clientelism, and of course everything that all results in a, in a, in a massive poverty and, and of course lack of foreign investments and uh, the economy that is producing really poor and hopeless people. Uh, it seems to me also that and it's a good sign that, that in the last few months, the EU also has reached this conclusion and is start, starting to act more decisively, uh, by, among other things, by saying that until the judiciary system is reformed from its current uh, status, uh, the Bosnia will not be able to, to join the uh, European Union. And I hope that generally this is the kind of messages that will start finally arriving from Basel 
two people that Brussels is negotiating here with, which is the political elites, which is mostly people who were involved in the wars of the 90s, people who are nationalists. Simply put, these people will not deliver. They will pay the lip service to the EU, but they will not deliver the necessary reforms. The changes that happened in the last week, which I started to talk about earlier, in which a more resolute stand by EU basically produced the resignation of the head of the high judiciary, uh, HCPC as we call it here, uh, is in part because of the latest scandal that he was involved in which seemed to be peddling with his political influence to get somebody a job. But I have to say that I do believe that the fundamentally his position was uh, by the committee, which was started uh, for the first time six months ago in, in, at the state parliament, of which I am the member at, at this mandate house of representatives at the state level, where Mr. Naut, uh, the member of Nasha Stranka, against uh, a very strong resistance and, and political obstacles managed to found the investigative committee with a with the purpose of uh, fact finding mission about what's wrong with our, our judiciary system and in 20 sessions that they held and as many witnesses as they questioned during those sessions it became obvious that there is something terribly wrong with our ju judiciary system and that there can be no talk about the rule of law until such a judiciary or prosecutorial committee is uh, in place. Also, I have to say that, you know, as I said, the country was treated as a special needs. It is impossible to find a country. Our judiciary system has been um, organized uh, uh, both legislatively and in case, has been held by international community. And they formed a body, the highest body of judiciary system, which consists of judges, prosecutors, and lawyers, active lawyers. And they formed a, basically a system in which, you, if you can imagine, these people who are judges, prosecutors, and lawyers, they get to sit in the same room and make decisions about who's going to be the judge and who's going to be the prosecutor. And of course, the lawyers who are trading with their votes, and of course, expecting later the favors from the judges and prosecutors that they voted. I mean, when you really break it down to this, it, it looks almost like, like somebody was joking. So this is, it, it is very, very important that we go uh, and, and reform, reform this uh, committee as soon as possible, because that will give us hope to move forward. And I will end up just uh, this part of my conversation, uh, participation, uh, with, with just few sentences, if you like. The EU needs to be cognizant of the fact that we need the real changes in judiciary system. Smoke screens will simply not do. Replacing one corrupt individual with another will just buy the governing parties another, another five years. Uh, and uh, when I say that they need to work also with the political forces, who proved, and we, the opposition parties on a state level, we worked with the parties across the entity line to form this investigative committee, which gave these amazing results for us. I mean, first time that somebody, person like this, resigns in That's really important if we do want to give a, a chance to the rule of law in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And as I said, I think this is for citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina our last and best hope. We need justice, and for justice, we need uh, a good judicial system, which is not under political influence. Thank you. Valerie, we cannot hear you. Oh my goodness. Uh Sorry for that. I muted myself. It's a classic uh, Zoom uh, Zoom mistake. Um, 
I just I was saying thank you very much, Mr. Koyevich, for that treaty core and for the exhortation to the EU to uh, not just put up smoke screens. And before going to Mr. Heinz, though, I wanted just to, to ask you if you could share a little bit more of your concrete experiences as well um, in government in the canton of Sarajevo, where your party led the Minister of Ministry of Justice um, and will potentially likely appoint the new Minister of Justice. What did you learn from that brief time about the possibility for reforms in, in the cantonal level in the judiciary? It was uh, really amazing, as, uh, as you know, and I know a reporter on that, Valerie, is uh, in 2018, after election results, we formed a coalition of six parties. It was the first time ever in Bosnia that a coalition was formed based on very concrete programs. Uh, we had a, a made a policy commitments on certain things. There were more than 300 laws and measures and decisions that were already decided before the government was formed. Unlike the nationalists who make coalitions to divide the spoils of elections, so to speak, companies and public ministerial functions. And uh, of course, we started really uh, heavily with uh, anti-corruption measures with obligation of elected uh, and named officials to uh, to list their uh, assets, the removal of nepotism and party influence, public employment and procurement and the like. And then something happened which is really rare in Bosnia. When that government, by political maneuvering by two parties getting secretly out of this coalition agreement, uh, was taken down, uh, there was a survey done in Canton Sarajevo, and 70% of Sarajevans felt sorry for that government. I mean, they, they wanted that government. They were against uh, that government being replaced. 70% exceeded at the time the percentage all these parties who formed the government actually had together. And that tells us something that for the first time, people of Canton Sarajevo saw a government that was European, that was progressive, and who was obviously not working for self or party interests, but rather for their own interests. Uh, the good, uh, of course, I mean, we were taken down by this uh, political uh, maneuvering of, uh, of our uh, coalition partners, two of them. But I also have a good news. I mean, uh, the reaction of people on, uh, the, the, during these local elections, which we just had in uh, Canton Sarajevo in Bosnia and Mostar we will have in the next few days, where this coalition that formed the cantonal government now won the local ele election by 70%. And also it's a good news to say that uh, as a result of all of this and our hard work in the last year, the government of 2018, which was led by the uh, Prime Minister from Nasha Franka, which I'm the President of, is going to be back by the new year. So but I also think, you know, that's something because there were so many resources devoted to taking that government of 2018, Porto's government, as we call it, because it was the last name of our prime minister, had was the the fear of the nationalists because they they realized that we found the concept which they treated like a, a virus, almost, and, and they were afraid that it's going to catch on that basically now all citizens will require the parties to, to come out with a concrete program and measures, what they want to do, and that, that kind of new politics and, and new spirit in Bosnian politics will, uh, will live, and that's really what they were afraid of. I mean, the, the, that was really amazing. But I'm really also pleased to say that people on Sarajevo really uh, said, no, this is the kind of future we want. We want people who make program, who sit down, who make compromises, and who do things that uh, really establish the, the, the trust in the institutions, and gives us like sense that there is a European future for us. Thank you very much, Mr. Kojevic. Um, your experience in the canton reminds me a bit of what happened in Kosovo, actually, where we had the first uh, government fall just after the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I want to move to Mr. Heinz.
Um, you have devoted your career to strengthening democratic culture and institutions worldwide, and, and RBF is incredibly active and present in the Western Balkans. Can you share with us your view about how a bottom-up approach to supporting civil society can help rectify top-down generated problems, um, as we see with the constitution that, that Bosnia has from Dayton? What are some of the opportunities of this approach, but also what kind of limits are there? And you know, what other elements besides civil society are needed to make it work? Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Valerie. And I want to congratulate and express my thanks to the European Council Nations for organizing this timely and important conversation. And, um, and to say that it is a pleasure and an honor to be on this panel with my fellow panelists. You know, we at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, which is a private American foundation, a donor organization, as it were, we work very hard uh, to create a, a kind of a balance between support for top-down change and bottom-up movement. Um, we see them both as essential to strengthen democracy, um, but it is a question of calibration. And the calibration really is dependent on a deep analysis of the context. So in Bosnia, it's a very specific case. And how we work to support civil society while also trying to strengthen the institutions of governance becomes complicated. And we take our lead from the people of Bosnia themselves, especially those who are working together in various civil society organizations and movements. What we find is that significant change, whether it's in Bosnia or in the United States, significant change most often comes as the result of a moment when movements and leaders converge. Bottom-up efforts can create new narratives that inspire and motivate people. Um, they generate citizen energy, um, they contribute ideas, and they build leaders. At the same time, you need the top-down efforts, you need the parliament, you need the government institutions, because they're the transmission belts that translate the, the citizen energy, the movement energy, into actual policy that affects people's lives. I um, experienced this dynamic firsthand in Central and Eastern Europe, where I lived and worked for a decade after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And the story of Eastern Europe's post-communist trajectory, the wave of democratization in the 1990s, followed by some of the backsliding that we're witnessing today and that you, Valerie, are documenting on the pages of the Financial Times, that story centrally, I think, revolves around the question of bottom-up and top-down democratic engagement. And here's what I mean. Eastern Europe's post-communist countries were able to write constitutions and create democratic institutions nearly overnight. Freedom of the press, free elections, functioning parliaments, etc. But they failed to fortify those institutions with a sustained bottom-up effort to build a democratic culture, the habits, the norms, and the values of democracy, which are the foundation, really, for the democratic institutions. Without that healthy democratic culture, which resides in the hearts and minds of the citizen, the foundations are, are weak and the institutions are easily manipulated. And I think this is part of what we are seeing in Bosnia today. It's also what we're seeing in places like Poland and Hungary, unfortunately. And I, I think it's important that we not forget that the historic changes that swept through Central Europe in the late 1980s and in some parts of the Balkans in the late 1990s were propelled by civil society and individual citizens who demanded change. Think of the hundreds of thousands who turned out on the streets in Belgrade to bring Milosevic down in 2000. Frederick Douglass, the great American abolitionist, fam famously said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and never will. And the demand 
comes from the people through civil society. So I think in Eastern Europe and in the Balkans today, a core challenge is that governments traditionally see civil society and independent journalism as adversaries. Civil society actors are cast, you know, variously as enemies of the state or mercenaries or foreign agents, etc. And rather than protect a vibrant civil society and freedom of the press, as it should, the judiciary frequently serves as an aggressive instrument of executive power to attack and suppress this vital sector. And in fact, I really have come to believe quite deeply that where there is no civil society, there's no democracy. It's that simple. And so I think one of the things that will help achieve a much more rigorous rule of law in Bosnia is a stronger civil society. And in fact, that's what the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and other donors are attempting to support. But it's hard work and it needs more help. But there is, you know, there is some good news, too. And I want to end this early intervention with a with a more optimistic thought. You know, in spite of all the obstacles and in spite of the corruption, people are organizing. Movements are forming. Citizens are demanding transparency and justice. They are demanding government action on issues ranging from the local to the national, from, you know, cleaning up a municipal park to mounting a more robust response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, Mr. Koyevich just told the story of what happened in the Sarajevo Canton, and it's an inspiring story. It, it shows the way that the future can be. These movements often start pretty small, but they can often build up very quickly. And here's where collaborations between NGOs and strategic philanthropy and the support of multilateral and bilateral donors can make all the difference. You know, truly modest amounts of financial and social capital can go a long way in fortifying these movements in the face of power structures that seek to extinguish them. So I think this is vitally important to the process in Bosnia. Thank you so much. You've said quite a lot, actually, that I want to come back to you on, especially these uh, moments where uh, people and, and leaders converge and um, the, the way that the judiciary often attacks the free press and the civil society rather than protecting them. Um, but I want to go to Austrian Justice Minister Alma Zadic um, and ask about why rule of law in Bosnia and the Balkans matters from the point of view of an EU member state, especially one that plays such an important economic and political role uh, in BIH and the region. Why is it in your country's interest to have a functioning rule of law? And how can interested member states such as Austria better support EU efforts and local civil society efforts uh, to press for necessary reforms in BIH? Well, first of all, uh... Uh, let me thank you also for this invitation on this uh, and to be on this uh, precious set of podium and uh, to have the pleasure also to discuss the rule of law topics uh, together with this honorable audience. Um, and to answer your question, I do think that the rule of law is the backbone of any social, political and economic society in Europe. Um, society in general, I would say, not only in Europe. Um, and to establish the same rules and mechanisms for everyone, um, it's important to offer the same equal opportunities for each and everyone. Um, so not to have only a small little elite, but to have equal opportunities for each and for everyone. And I think that this is the main driver of any economic but also social development. Um, and that's why rule of law and the, the rule of law mechanism is, is one of the, uh, of the backbones of one of the most important um, mechanisms that uh, uh, society, that the state actually has to offer. Um, it also, if you think, think about it from a practical point of view, um, who wants to open a new business if the authorities uh, cannot issue a license, for example, in a fair and a transparent matter, or who can rely on an independent impartial court or independent and impartial justice 
if you know that with the offer of an envelope, you can get the one or the other result. Um, so I think that's why, um, and then I think the other, um, why it's important that uh, the rule of law and the equal opportunities, the transparency um, is visible in particular in the justice system, is uh, visible in the government system and so on. And if we miss the point of initially establishing rule of law, we hand over prosperity and future to those who only think about themselves and never about their, own, their country, the community, the society. So I think well, that's why it's uh, of utmost importance to build on a strong foundation, to build a strong rule of law foundation uh, from the very beginning in order to establish and um, try to, to establish leaders and, and leaders that um, put their country first and not their own self-interest. Um, <clears throat> I also may stre stress and I also want to stress that this is not a local problem of one entity or one community in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's also not, not all, only the problem of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but it's very visible in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I do think that we are sitting here in the same boat in this regard. Either we all put our most efforts to establish a fair and prosperous future for all of us, or we fail together. And um, if you think about it, um, in addition, is in particular Austria, for example, um, Austria is sharing the same cultural background with Southeastern European regions. Stability in Bosnia and Herzegovina means stability in the region, but it also means stability in Austria. And I can and I want to emphasize that Austria is and will always be a stable and a reliable partner for the region and also for Bosnia and Herzegovina because there is this common background, this common uh, cultural background, but also there are so many ways how Austria and, and the region is intertwined. That's why I think it's also in our interest to, to be a reliable partner and help uh, and support the region to establish the, a strong foundation, to establish a strong uh, rule of law system. Um, but first, but at first, an important message, we may provide good examples and share also experiences because um, also in Austria, we have to overcome a lot of challenges. As you probably recall, um, the European Commission issued a report on rule of law in the European member states where all of the, the countries in the European Union were called upon make things better and to uh, reform the one or the other thing. So I think fighting for rule of law and fighting, fighting for transparency and for justice is a continuous fight. It's not only something that you do and then it's done and over, but it's something that you do on a continuous basis um, because also uh, Mr. Heinz has mentioned before, um, the citizens, they demand transparency and they demand justice and all of the countries in the European Union are still not there where the citizens wants them to be. Um, and my second point that I would like to raise and the second message that I would like to, to, to point out apart from the rule of law is um, I would like to talk about also about accountability. Everyone who has a public function has also a task and an, an obligation to serve the society and it's also an obligation to be to be held accountable if things go wrong and responsibility and accountability also helps to build public trust into the system with the foundation the rule of law on the one hand but on the other hand that you have responsible but also accountable leaders will help the public to establish public trust into the system and will help the country prosper and will help to establish the trust in the in the, the state um, and I'm sure and surely and also I would like to emphasize that 
that we as an international community, but also, of course, Austria as, na as a neighbor, uh, will always be critical, but will always be there to, to help and provide support as much as possible. Because as I mentioned before, stability in Bosnia and Herzegovina means stability for the region, but also means, means stability in Austria and the European Union. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you so much, Minister Zadic. I must say, in my more than 10 years of, of covering this region, um, I was covering as well the uh, Ibiza affair, which um, brought your party later into, or into, into government. And I think it was the first time in, in my more than 10 years covering Southeastern Europe, which you said can be also included Austria, uh, that I was at a press conference and that the day after, something dramatic was revealed about a politician and incidents of alleged corruption, uh, the leader resigned. Um, I think it, it's been very, very rare to, to see that in, in the countries further south that I cover, uh, despite many, many affairs and, and, and scandals. Um, and I look forward to continuing the discussion about what, how concretely uh, Austria can um, help the region more. Um, not that I'm holding up specific politicians uh, from Austria as a model to be emulated, but in resignation, perhaps that is uh, one of the ways. Um, I want to come back to, to Mr. Kojevic as well. Um, and ask uh, more specifically about, about the accountability. You know, we've seen uh, just this last uh, few weeks, uh, just in the last few days, um, one very high profile resignation of the um, head of the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council after a second major scandal. Um, we've seen also the an indictment of the Federation Prime Minister. Um, are we looking at more uh, accountability? Are, are we looking at institutions that, that really work? Or is this just emphasis that corruption is rampant? And, and how do you uh, specifically suggest that um, high level officials, especially in the judiciary, be held accountable for their misdeeds? If not well, thank you. I mean, uh... <laughs> I, I don't think that uh, the cases that you mentioned uh, should suggest that the system is working, that the system started working. I think uh, it was just uh, a little bit, uh, I mean, it was a little bit over the top. We have people, we have, we have nothing to preserve the status quo. And, and the things that were done by these people were just uh, outrageous and uh, threatened uh, some kind of social uh, revolution on the streets. And I think this was actually, th these moves that you, th th these cases that you mentioned, actually served to preserve the status quo, to create an image of that something is being done about these things while actually at the core of the system uh, these people are still doing the same things that they always did and then they will do if we let them do it for i mean m m much longer in the future you know at some point i mean in politics you you stop uh, and i think this was maybe a mistake from the beginning was you know, that's what's called, uh, what I call a, a liberal paradox. You know, you're trying to find an excuse for everybody's, everyone's opinion and stand and kind of have an understanding for it and like tolerate it. And I think that was the biggest mistake that the liberals did in, uh, in, since 1989 and, uh, and, and, and what we see. I, I, I think, I mean, I speak for the, for the most of the citizens of Bosnia when I, when, when I say, that our problems are common, that our dream of what kind of life we as a citizens, as individuals, would like to have in Bosnia are very similar. But all these have been hijacked by these political elites, not only in Bosnia, in America, in, uh, in, Euro in Europe, with radical movements. You know, quite honestly, I mean, on, on a philosophical level, I do believe that the politics is trying to find the balance between the three principles. One is principle of equality, and the other one is principle of personal freedom, individual freedom. And how you combine these in society so that we are equal but free and at the same time. But all these things, 
even though the liberals won, we won against the Hitler, we, won, we took down the Berlin Wall, but then since 2013-14, we've been losing again. And you know, it's just, I'm wondering, really, I mean, does every generation have to go through some horror in order to understand the value of the values of liberal democracy and things? Anyway, what I, what, what I was saying about the Bosnia, what we need right now, what we are focused is three very important laws. Laws on conflict of interest, law on high judiciary and prosecutorial committee, and we need a law on a public procurement. Because you have to do these things to, to, to limit the, uh, the resources of the nationalists. Because these law, I mean, that's where they get their power from. You know, they never formed the institutions. They never strengthened the state institutions because they want to be institutions. And it's with sadness that I have to say this, that when European officials or American officials are meeting with our national leaders who have no public function in a bars and restaurants and make deals about election laws or about the future in Bosnia, it sends a very, very bad message to, to people of Bosnia. Because really the politics then, when you see the images of them sitting at the dining table with a dinner talking about election law. Why is election law negotiated in restaurants with people who don't, who are not the president of the country or president of legislative bodies? Why are these discussions being held outside of parliament? So, you know, I hope that we are all learning the, the, the lesson here. You can't advise us to do something that you don't do. And you can't support the bad guys who are saying that you really hope that there's going to be a new generation of politicians that will take Bosnia out of this nightmare in which it lives for the last 25 years. We deserve better. These people deserve better. I've been a war reporter for 20 years. I've been to many conflicts in the world. And I could see everywhere how the fear is the cheapest fuel in politics if you are bastard enough to use it. I saw it from America. In, when, when Bush found the first time, when he published that image of him standing at the rubble of the tr World Trade Center and saying, do you, want to, do you want this to happen again to you when John Kerry lost? I saw it in Rwanda, in Somalia, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, everywhere. And this has to stop. People, people, and I'm really, I mean, pleased to say that I'm proud to be uh, in an organization, in a, in a group of people, and in people who are in other parties and in, who live in other entities and that we are more and more coming to an understanding that this is what is this all about. It's not about the human rights. It's not about the ethnic representation. Can I just say one thing? We, they say that the biggest problem here is the legitimacy of representatives. That Croats could be elected only by Croats, Serbs only by Serbs and Bosniaks only by Bosniaks. But most of our young people from Bosnia, 73,000 last year, went to Europe, to Austria, where Alma is, to Sweden, Switzerland, where they will not have the legitimate representatives. There are no crowds, obligatory crowds in the Swedish government, but they are happy because they're going to be protected as citizens with a functioning judiciary system, which will protect their human and citizens' rights. So all I'm saying is Bosnia is not a country with special needs. Whatever is good for Norwegians is good for us. And that's the approach that the Europe should take. Don't lower the standards for us to get into the EU, but help us reach those standards because that's good for us and it's going to be good for them. And then just before I end, ask yourself one question. And that's what I, something that I always ask myself. We have a lot of politicians who are saying that the Bosnia is not a possible country because there are different peoples, multi-ethnic. I don't think so. I mean, I think we are one country with, of course, different um, ethnic and, and, and religious groups and, and stuff like that, just like any other country in Europe and in the world, just like any other country. So don't treat us like a special case. 
but just help us reach those standards. We can do this with a little help from our friends. Thank you, Mr. Klevich. I um, actually want to ask Ms. von Kramen to, to respond to, to the allegation that the EU is complicit or to ask the question of, of if the EU is complicit. But I also just want to quickly ask you, you know, you said that fear is the cheapest fuel in politics. But how do you then t get those young people, 73,000 of whom have left recently, uh, excited about a law on public procurement, uh, a law on conflict of interest? And what is your what is your party doing to to make this into a movement? You know, it's 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 a harder flag to rally around, isn't it? It's a it's a difficult decision that you have to make. Our party made a decision form the partnership with other parties who we have some very I mean major ideological differences which we decided to put aside in the interest of the country and the citizens economy and social affairs and, and, and everything else and we as a party maybe paid a little bit of the price for it by losing a part of our identity but moving our country forward. For example, it's like you are in a soccer team, your team did win, but you didn't score any goals. I'm not saying, I mean, what I'm saying is it, it, it re really requires some sort of uh, serving the higher interest, not your party, narrow party interest or your personal po political interest. We did that. And then also what we did is we we won big in Sarajevo by 70% for the first time after the war. We did, Valerie, really things that were unimaginable a few years ago. Sergeant Mandic, who is an ethnic Serb, won in the center municipality of Sarajevo, which is as a city, 93% Bosnian. Because people for the first time said, hey, I don't care who this guy is. I don't care if he's Serb, Croat or Bosniak. I like him, I like his program, I trust him, I want him to be my mayor. And that's what we are doing. It takes a lot of mileage, it takes a lot of uh, talking to people on the street, it's a hard work. It's much easier to drop the, the nationalist fuel on the streets and lit it with a little match and, 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 and you have fire and then of course you have choices that people have been making for the last 20 years. What we do is a really hard work, going from person to person and convincing them to choose the better future. Thank you so much, Mr. Klevich. I want to bring in now Ms. von Kramon and ask, uh, what do you see, what do you think about Mr. Klevich's... Uh, Sorry, my, 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 my picture, everything is frozen. I don't see anything. Maybe I come back in a second and you asked uh, or you address one question to another well, panelist sorry I minister Zadic then i was going to spare you from this one but but uh, are you um as as a justice minister of an eu member state do you see the eu being complicit and by popular demand i'm afraid i have to ask you um if you as austria which has which again um plays such an important role economically and politically in the region have thought about the idea of bringing sanctions or travel bans on some of the politicians who actively impede um the, the functioning of, of BIH. Thanks. Oh no, you're muted. You did the same as me. There you go. Great. Okay. Now, now, now I, now here we goes. Um, well, first of all, I mean, I, uh, first of all, I do think that um, Bosnia and Herzegovina um, requires the European Union um, to push certain reforms forward. I, for a very long time, was of the opinion that um, um, reforms, necessary reforms, can come with from within. And I really, I'm still, I still hope that this is possible. And from the last elections that I've seen, um, I, I, and also what uh, Mr. Kojovic had said. Um, for example, in Sarajevo or in some other cities, the, the citizens' option was the option that was chosen and not the option, um, the ethnic line option, let's put it that way. Because, and as he mentioned also, it's so much easier if I say vote for me because I am 
um, ethnic Croat, ethnic Bosniak, or ethnic Serb, or vote for me because I'm a woman. <laughs> but um, and it's so much harder to convince people to vote for you because of, uh, of your program and because you want to move the country forward. Um, but nonetheless, I do believe that it is necessary. The European Union has a very important function and has the importance to um, also through certain measures and but also through pressure um, make sure that certain reform, reforms are happening. Um, and I do think that Austria can play a very, uh, very important role in this regard. Um, with regards to the, to the second part of the questions, um, with regards to the sanctions for people who, que to, to, who put in question the, ex the existence of the state, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, who put in question uh, or who deny um, that, uh, for example, genocide happened, um, that's actually something that somehow is now coming more to be discussed. It's not something that people that that um, on the European level or in Austria, it's um, it's it's um, it's it's already thought about, but it is being discussed because it's it's still unbelievable that after um, 25 years after the war after the Dayton's agreement, people still question the state itself, and they still um, after all these judgments that came out of the ICTY, um, there are still there's still this this questioning of of, um, of crimes against humanity, of genocide, and so on ha that happened uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So this is something that also in Austria, but also on the European um, Union level, it's just not understood. Um, also, if you look, for example, in Austria. Um, we have very, very strict laws if you um, deny the existence of Holocaust, um, and it's good that we have these laws. Um, so that's why, for example, in particular in Austria, it's not um, understood when people uh, put these things in question. I hope I answered Thank your question somehow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, well, Ms. von Kremen, why don't you respond a bit? You know, uh, during all of my years in the region, uh, so often, you know, I've met uh, an endless parade, I guess, of, I shouldn't call it a parade, but, but many, many uh, diplomats and, and, and enthusiastic um, heads of EU delegation and people who, who genuinely believe and are committed to, to Bosnia and want to make change. But they also say, well, we have no choice. These are the people that uh, have been elected. You know, people get the politicians they deserve. This is what we have to do. And, and um, you know, the same parties and the same leaders then continue to, to uh, dominate the political landscape in the country. And um, so I want to come back to the question that I was asking you, you know, um, and, and they socialize with these people. They maybe negotiate deals with them in, in nice restaurants. Um, is the EU complicit from your perspective? And, and what kind of um, oversight can the European Parliament um, engage in that regard? Thank you very much, Valerie, to Maya, and also to all the other panelists. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with uh, most of the things you have mentioned, and also the former panelists, especially Sabina and, and uh, Jim O'Brien. Uh, well, the EU definitely needs to complicit it, uh, at, at least at, at some point. But let me reiterate also, I mean, people's expectations so that they do not leave the region is that we will use our power to to change the the structures this is exactly what jim o'brien and and most of you have have said and if we don't use our money as a proper stick uh, the, the 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 carrots are obvious the carrots are is the path to towards the eu integration it's it's the soft power it's the possibility uh, um, well, to integrate uh, in also the cultural uh, things and, and, and everything which was said before. But really, I mean, um, of course, you cannot, as we say in German, bake your politicians. Yeah, well, that's that's clear. I mean, we have to deal with the people who are in charge and who are elected or who are uh, who have the mandate. That's for sure. But nevertheless, the rhetoric, I think we can harshly change the rhetoric in many uh, uh, things. And it would be much more obvious where we stand, what kind of uh, uh, views and position we have. And this is, I think, 
often much too um, diplomatic. While I see, of course, this is also what was said by, by Alma and by Mr. Koryovich, uh, that if you are critical, you are always, especially myself, I'm anti-Kosovo, I'm anti-Serbian, I'm anti-whatsoever. No, I re um, rely on a, let's say, more principle-based uh, policy approach. And, and that's not because we think uh, this is a good idea of the European uh, Union, but this is what we have to deliver if we want to uh, improve the uh, standard of living. This is exactly was, uh, what Mr. Kojovic said. We have to implement uh, this judiciary reform. When 80% of the population in Bosnia and Herzegovina complain about that nothing has changed in terms of judiciary, that no reforms were implemented, but still we give a lot of money, we get a lot of do uh, donation and funds and everything, because we have to also find, let's say, means to, to get this uh, capital out because it was dedicated to, uh, to, the, to the region. And I think this is absolutely uh, uh, disgraceful that we even, um, I mean, <laughs> the, the wrong uh, structures, the wrong people get the money for doing nothing. And, and that, of course, keeps people in power uh, and of course, the, the civil society, as Mr. Heinz has said, uh, needs to be strengthened. Yes, but they will be absolutely upset and disappointed and they will resignate and they don't know how to uh, counter this uh, disbalance of, of, of power plus money plus influence plus state capturing. And so I wish uh, the EU, of course, we have to negotiate. Of course, we have to sit together, maybe also in a restaurant. But please be honest and be, be, be harsh and be, be open and use this, let's say, direct access then to make a difference. And what I really miss is then in the end, the result is so poorly, the, the, as you has mentioned, the, the uh, laws on public procurement are not even properly drafted, they are not implemented and people are not um, um, hold accountable and so on and so forth. That's the problem. And if you make this public, uh, you will be blamed by individual uh, politicians. So we as a European Union, together with the, with the US, have to use the sticks plus uh, the, um, the carrots. And what we see now, for example, with the economic and investment plan, this is absolutely purely, uh, poorly, uh, sorry, a drafted until now. We have no benchmarks. Um, there is <laughs> um, uh, conditionality on 28 pages is mentioned once. Uh, uh, fundamentals is mentioned twice and rule of laws is mentioned, uh, rule of law is mentioned seven times. So most of the things is about big projects, big infrastructure projects. We are again investing in asphalt and mainly this project where the absorption capacities are not there. This can be only absorbed by a big central um, uh, national uh, levels, if so. But there's no local communities, there's no soft power, there's no people-to-people -people contact, there's no peer group uh, education, there's no, I don't know, uh, smaller mobility uh, projects and so on and so forth. So uh, the majority of this money, over 40%, goes into this big infrastructure projects. And that's exactly what we, where we uh, will see another missed chance and another missed opportunity. And then after seven years, people will uh, migrate even more. And the EU will say, yeah, but we have given you so much money. Why didn't you do anything out of this? Yes, because we didn't give them the clear benchmarks, the clear policy framework, what we would like to see with this money, what they are supposed to do with it. Yes, it, it, it sounds a little bit empirical. It sounds a little bit... Um, not on the same, let's say, equal uh, playing field, but we could, uh, you could even structure this dialogue in a different way. And uh, I guess that Nasha Skaranka and also Albin Kurti in, in, in Kosovo were absolutely able to absorb this money in a complete different way. And they make a difference. And we have seen the UNP uh, monitoring 
in April, in May in Kosovo. That's a huge difference to what we have seen half a year ago. And so people really, I mean, they recognize, they understand if they have a proper and a stronger government to what they have seen before. But if the EU doesn't make a difference in their rhetoric and they just say we have to deal with what we have and we cannot even speak out, about what we appreciate and where's the strength and the weaknesses in the government, then I guess it is also very difficult for the people to understand where the EU values are and where not. Thank you so much. Uh, really a lot of fruit, uh, food for thought and it's uh, really um, great that we have the head of the EU delegation here to, to comment on this. But I want to go to Mr. Heinz First, actually, I see that, that you had your hand up. Um, I wanted to ask you, when you hear all of these structural problems, when you hear also issues on the side of the, of the, e, of the EU and, and the poor benchmarking, you know, how do you as a, as a philanthropist respond? And, and I just, I wanted to actually underline um, a story that uh, I was last week in Bosnia and Bushko and I met a 25 year old politician who was born two weeks actually before the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed. And um, he was running for office for the first time. People came to him and offered to sell him 200 votes. Uh, he was not interested and he, went, and he went to the police, you know, at great um, risk to his personal safety. And uh, the police said, oh, we don't really know. We can't do this. So he went to the Center for Investigative Reporting based in Sarajevo. And they said, yeah, we'll wear a wire. We'll do it. And only after the journalists got involved, did the police start doing their work? Did the prosecution start doing their work? And did they start to put people away? Which I think really shows not only the role of the media and its importance, critical importance for, for, for making a difference, but also the um, uh, the very small amount of money that needs to be invested in a small journalism NGO to really drive change. And I wanted to ask you, you know, when you see this, um, the, the sort of field in front of us from, from problems of local politicians to issues um, with insufficient benchmarks, where do you as a philanthropist think that, uh, that you can make the best strategic acupuncture um, investment in the future? Thank you. Sorry for the long question. No, no, it's a, it's a it's a very pertinent question, and you've given a very good example. And I'm I'm very proud to say that the Center for Investigative Journalism is one of our grantees, precisely for the reasons that you describe. Um, they are one node in a network of accountability, and if we are really going to see progress on rule of law and on democracy and on the economy it's going to come through accountability. And so this is one of the really important functions of civil society. The Center for Investigative Journalism is an entity of the civil society of Bosnia. Um, and there are other organizations, dozens of them, that are also playing the role of accountability. And this is extremely important. And I wanted to say, I thought that, that what um, Viola von Kromov was saying was very, very important about the you know, the, the, the powers, whether it's the United States, the European Union, or bilateral uh, donor agencies of, of governments, tend to invest in, in big projects. Um, and they think about infrastructure a lot. And I, I want to propose the notion of civic infrastructure and suggest that it might be in places like Bosnia, which is um, struggling with its democratic development, um, a wiser investment might be in the civic infrastructure. And what do I mean by that? Well, it is this ecosystem of civil society entities, citizen developed, citizen invented, citizen led organizations that give people a way of working together across ethnic differences, across communities and solving problems and also holding power accountable. And I think for the EU, if you are tired of investing in governments that are not producing or tired of supporting political leaders who are unprincipled, look to the civic infrastructure and become a bigger partner in strengthening civil society where the real heart of Bosnia resides. Thank you so much. Uh, what an exhortation. I think it's it's really time to bring in Mr. Johan Sattler, the head of the EU delegation in BIH, also um, 
an Austrian, uh, to, to respond to, to some of the demands that are being made on the EU, some of the criticism, and, and to ask, you know, again, uh, as we mentioned, these two uh, critical incidents, the uh, indictment of the uh, Federation Prime Minister, the resignation of um, the head of the HGPC, you know, are these signifying that, that you know, the, with a little bit of pressure, as, as Ms. Chudic said in the last panel, you know, a lot of things can happen. Does this signify that there will be a more active approach? Is this um, something that we can see more of? Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie, and, uh, and uh, thanks for being a part of this uh, panel uh, and uh, for especially putting uh, this panel up front and, and organizing uh, a panel on the rule of law, which I believe uh, is one of the major uh, uh, problems in this country. If you want to put it down to, uh, to only two major issues, uh, which BIH has, which of course is not true, uh, but if you would do that, I think uh, it would be rule of law and the lack of functionality of BIH. I think these are the two uh, uh, major ailments, and uh, I think it's very important to, to focus on this one. Uh, before uh, coming to your question, let me just uh, start with a little uh, story from, uh, uh, from uh, my work here. Uh, three weeks ago, we did a, a big conference uh, on rule of law. Uh, it was called Bravo na Pravtu, and some of you were there, also Minister Sadix was there, uh, and there were two remarkable things uh, which, uh, which I want to tell you about. One, uh, on the negative side, uh, and you heard Mr. Koyevich speak about the state of the judiciary uh, and the lack of rule of law. Uh, on substance, since the uh, so-called preview report a year ago, basically nothing has happened. And we have been also clear in our report from the European Commission in October, some would say brutally clear, uh, but I believe uh, uh, we shouldn't waste time uh, beating around the bush. Uh, on the positive side, uh, 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 let me tell you that uh, we had quite a, a, a participation. So apart from the, and you know how difficult it is to, to organize these events these days, these hybrid events. We had 20 people in the room, we had 300 people on Zoom, and guess how many people we had online, uh, meaning on, on the social networks, on Facebook. It was 35,000 people following us online and also interacting. Um, now, what does it tell you? It tells you that there is a huge uh, a discontent. There was also a lot of abuse uh, in the fora, very difficult to manage. Uh, but uh, this tells you that there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the judiciary. You've seen in the video in the beginning the, the figures 70% uh, having no trust whatsoever in the judiciary, 90% uh, uh, you know, having encountered corruption, but also very interestingly, 97% not uh, having ever reported corruption. Uh, this is also an issue of fear. There is fear around. There is also lack of whistleblower protection, which we are basically now started, uh, started to work on. Um, but what is, what is important, and this brings me to Mr. Heinz's point, is uh, uh, I think uh, we have to combine this pressure from above uh, with, uh, with the pressure from underneath. Um, you have um, uh, heard about the HJPC, what's going on there. Uh, and I believe what, we've, what we are seeing now in terms of uh, of the steps taken there, which are absolutely overdue, uh, is, uh, is a combination of these uh, two factors, uh, uh, pressure from above and, 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 and pressure from, from, from beneath. I think uh, uh, the, the lack of accountability, as Ms. Sadic has said, this lack of accountability is one of the biggest problems here. Um, in, in going forward um, and answering to, to some, some parts of your question, uh, Valerie, what do we need to do? I think what we have to do is on the one hand, from our side, to continue very much to being to becoming more forceful, to becoming also clearer in what we ask from the countries in the region, and in my case, from BIH, smart conditionality, I think, is the way to go. Let me give you one example, and I think uh, this hasn't happened in a long time. Uh, EU is giving 250 million euros to BIH uh, in macro financial assistance. Uh, this is because of the difficult situation uh, of. Uh, of COVID, uh, and um, we managed to get through that, you know, the second tranche of this uh, help to BIH will be conditioned uh, and only given out if there are changes to the HJPC law, uh, allowing for integrity checks, something we've been asking for quite some time, integrity checks for the highest official holders in the country. The same thing, by the way, something similar is happening with uh, uh, the IMF, uh, very important that we are here uh, uh, work in sync. Uh, the IMF is currently negotiating quite a big program, 750 million 
uh, uh, euros uh, and there will be a conditionality. Uh, and uh, many of the things which uh, we have put in our opinion of the European Commission, which BIH needs to fulfill, including the public procurement law, Mr. Koevich has been speaking about, it's a disgrace. This has been on the table for two years. Uh, it was not uh, possible to, to have a conclusion of this process. So uh, good to see that uh, uh, internationals uh, are, are teaming up uh, and, uh, and consulting. Important to, to continue this uh, smart conditionality. But the second part, without which we will not be able to move here uh, on a larger scale, is, uh, is on the civil society front. Uh, this has also been mentioned uh, by, by some of the speakers. Uh, citizens need to be involved. The 35,000 people I mentioned, I believe, are a good sign. I did an environment conference in October. There was also quite a big participation and interest, Sarajevo being uh, sometimes the most polluted city in the world. So I believe this, these are the, the things which are important uh, to keep in mind uh, in order to, to move uh, BIH forward. And let me say a last sentence on 21. Uh, I believe 2021 is um, the best chance in a long time for BIH uh, to get things done. Why? Well, first of all, there are no elections here. But secondly, also, uh, there is more interest from the European Union side. You've seen the visits going on here. And of course, there's also a new US administration um, by the way, we will not wait until the 20th of uh, January. Uh, we have been working here actually quite well also in the last year and a half. And to be honest, without uh, a functioning uh, EU-US axis on the ground here, the Moster agreement would not have happened. But I'm very happy to see uh, a, a st even stronger focus on the region uh, from the side of the new uh, uh, US administration. What we need to focus, one rule of law we mentioned, this is the, the, the topic of the discussion now. But secondly, uh, I mentioned it in the beginning, functionality. We have to have, uh, uh, we have to use 2021 also to look at the functionality of BIH. This is part of the 14 key priorities of the European Union. Um, it's not blasphemous uh, to speak about changes to the constitution. This is a process which is a, a normal one. If you want to join the European Union. Every country joining the European Union, of course, had to do some adaptations, some changes to the constitution. This will be also necessary uh, for uh, BIH. Uh, and of course, I think uh, what we have to be aware of at the same time, it's not gonna be uh, an imposition. This is not 95, this is not 97. Uh, we are in 2020. It needs, we need to build uh, elements of consensus with the political st stakeholders. Yes, also with the party leaders, Yes, with the institutions, but also very much so uh, with, uh, with civil society. Uh, and uh, only if we manage to create a bit of a national debate, uh, and I want to help with that next year to get citizens involved, uh, like they are now more involved on the rule of law, I believe uh, uh, we, can, we can move forward. And, and I invite all the uh, uh, constructive players and the, the well-meaning actors uh, around also this virtual table to join us. Uh, in order for next year uh, to move forward, because I deeply believe that the country needs it and also its citizens uh, deserve it. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sattler. I think we should have, we can have a next uh, panel discussion about what the functionality of BIH actually would look like and mean and take. But I'm going to um, come back to Minister Zadic again for another difficult question. I'm sorry, but by popular demand, um, I, I think it's incumbent upon me to ask you. Um, uh, last year, when um, the EU and Paris essentially blocked uh, the opening of accession talks with Albania and North Macedonia. Around that time, um, French President Macron called Bosnia a ticking time bomb. Um, many, of course, have refuted this, but but it was a glaring reminder that uh, that many EU capitals don't really see a future for, for BIH inside of the EU anytime soon, and that, and that uh, they may pander to um, uh, enlargement skeptic publics. Um, do you have any suggestions for, for people who, in Bosnia, who want to continue going about building the rule of law, uh, even when there is no clear guarantee of membership if they do it and 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 what you know how do you convince them that that it that it must be done for for bosnia's sake and not only with with a transformative carrot of, of eu membership thank you you're muted 
now. I'm going to <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much. I do think it's um, a valuable reminder um, that you mentioned that um, not all EU member states have a, such a strong focus towards um, the region or towards Bosnia and Herzegovina as does Austria have. Also, because not only because of the um, of the geographical <laughs> um, um, being ge geographically near to the region, uh, but also due to the common history and and so on. And um, also, you've heard uh, Ambassador Sattler speaking. Uh, Valentin Insko, for example, is also Austrian. So there is a strong focus from Austria towards the region, um, and I, I do believe that we should. Um, try, I mean, and that's what, what Austria is also kind of doing in the European Union, also trying to, to emphasize the focus on the region. Um, because as you correctly mentioned, um, France or maybe some other countries do not have such a strong focus. And I think it's the job of the countries that have this focus on the region. Um, so also our job in Austria to make sure that it is on the discussion table again because i do i'm a, of a strong uh, belief and i i'm strongly convinced that now we have a window of opportunity if you look at the european um map there is this this uh, empty gap um the the western balkan that is still not in the european union and i do think that we should um, continue and should continue the discussions and bringing the region back to the table at the European Commission because in the very end the European Union um, can help to, to and can hold also the necessary carrots that is responsible that is necessary and uh, can uh, exert certain pressure to um, make sure that reforms necessary reforms can be done um, and I'm of um, strong opinion that um, that was actually also this carrot and this pressure was something that was necessary for Croatia, by, for example, to move towards the European Union. We have seen how that, have wor how that has worked um, and we should, uh, the European Union should, uh, should refocus again if, they want, if the European Union wants to integrate the region into the European Union. But apart from that, I do think that rule of law and the necessary changes, not only in the law, but also in the, uh, in the attitude, the necessary um, commitment towards accountability of leaders, um, that this is something that's not only necessary in order to move towards the European Union, but it's necessary for the citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina, so many young people, so many well-educated young people are leaving the country because they don't trust the country anymore. They don't have trust uh, in the and in, into the system. They don't feel being treated fairly, and they don't see their future there anymore. The future, they don't see the future for them or for their children um, to have a fair and prosperous future. And that's why I believe that emphasizing the rule of law is not only necessary for getting entering the European Union sometime, but also for the people to keep those people in the country, to have those people work for the country in order to, to, to move forward and uh, um, establish a brighter and more prosperous future for everyone. And I apologize that I'm short out of breath because I'm in the ninth month pregnant, which means, <laughs> yeah, which means I'm out of breath <laughs> very easily. Wow. So apologize for that. <laughs> I didn't notice any shortness of breath, but you've now blown us all away. Announcement, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> One good thing it, 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 it's, hard, it's, hard to, it. it's hard to speak. <laughs> Something, this is the one good thing of 2020. Um, thank you very much, Minister Zadic. Um, uh, Ms. von Krommen, we have a question from the audience um, that I will add to. Uh, the question comes from Angel Petrov. Um, and I will just underline that, you know, I'm sitting in the capital of an EU member state that had the most um, investigations by Olaf, I think, for 20, 2018 to 2019, that has refused to join the European Public Prosecutor's Office um, and that has uh, opposed um, 
rule of law benchmarks and future uh, accountability for future EU funds. And, and the question from, from Mr. Petrov is, how can the EU avoid falling into this trap, a cooperative government, uh, having a cooperative government uh, that improves everything during accession, um, but then, uh, uh, you know, following accession um, begins and doing everything. But, but I would add to that, while not falling into the trap of imposing all of the lessons learned from all the previous enlargements and making these countries wait forever. I mean, we saw that uh, judicial vetting in Albania is something that no other country has ever been asked to do. Um, and, and, and certainly um, can and, and may bring quite a lot of good in the long run, um, but has pushed um, uh, Albania's accession negotiations further down the line, for instance. So, so how to balance these two priorities between ensuring that a future next member state doesn't become a problem while not indefinitely kicking the can down the road? Thanks. Well, I, I, I see the point that uh, we, especially in the case of, of Hungary and, and, and Poland, uh, we have no, let's say, ir uh, we have this irreversibility and we have not a really sustainable track record on how we're going to deal if uh, the path for democracy uh, uh, was left. And, and that's definitely something uh, we have to put in the in the new agenda. So. But nevertheless, I mean, <clears throat> the amount of money we are ready now uh, to invest into those countries, all of the leaders have an interest. And that's why Orban was so heavily fighting against this so-called rule of law mechanism, which isn't really a rule of law mechanism, which is just a mechanism not to misuse EU funds. Unfortunately, it, it, it sounds much bigger than it finally is. The instrument is good. It's good enough to, to at least deter uh, uh, Orban and uh, Kaczynski or Mazowiecki a little bit, but it's definitely not sufficient to implement a real rule of law uh, mechanism. But nevertheless, what we should do now is, is the same thing, uh, that we want to have not just a draft law, but the implementation of this draft law, not just announcement of something where most of the authority and leaders are just great and then to sell it, but really go hand in hand uh, with looking uh, how uh, the impact is and this integrity call, for example, worked in, in Ukraine very well. We have uh, uh, the opportunity now to really look what kind of assets do the higher uh, court, uh, the, the judges of the higher court of the Supreme Court have where do their fortune come from and this kind of thing makes a huge difference for the politicians, for other uh, officials and so on and so forth. And the EU could just uh, insist on this together with the budget support, together with the uh, economic um, and investment plan, together with the uh, money from the IMF. This is a huge uh, amount of money and we could easily use this much better as a leverage and also for a sustainable leverage not just until the accession phase or this uh, transition phase is over. Yes, I know I don't want to delay uh, the negotiations talks and uh, frustrate the population even more. We have seen it now with the visa-free regime in Kosovo, while we have actually given uh, green light from the commission and from the parliament side. And still after two and a half years, nothing has happened. That's absolutely frustrating for the, uh, the civil society, but also for the politicians, while they actually have done their job and, and still the council cannot make up their mind. Yes, that is a very fine line to walk on. You're absolutely right. On one hand, we have to have this um, tough conditionality. On the other hand, we have to also then deliver if, if, if uh, um, conditions are being met we have to deliver and not really both of them uh, have have um, yeah have been fulfilled uh, during the last month and years that's true thank you so much mr kramen and um, we have uh, only 5 minutes left for mr heinz and mr kovich to make some final remarks mr heinz i do have a question for you but you can feel free to ignore it if there are other final remarks that that you'd prefer to make um and my question is really um about the fact that i think the the COVID-19 pandemic um, in this region especially, but all over the world, really kind of underscored um, 
the some of the the democratic deficiencies uh, that that we've seen in a lot of these countries and 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 governance deficiencies, right? We saw that it's not just necessarily a strong leader or um, the most democratic person. And we saw, for instance, in Bosnia that. Um, uh, corrupt procurement practices led to buying faulty respirators from a company with no history of um, uh, importing medical equipment. Um, so, but, my, but at the same time, we saw in the, the philanthropic world undergo a big discussion about how to best direct its resources, balancing between the immediate public health crisis and the previous commitments um, that, that that they had. And and I know that some, I'm not I'm definitely not talking about RBF, but you know there were, that some of these big donors redirected a lot uh, of resources to the public health crisis. How are you balancing um, these this this these both urgent pressing needs, the short-term needs and the, and the long-term commitment to ensuring rule of law in these countries. As I said, if you wanted to say something else, feel, please feel free to ignore my question, but that's something I'd like to no, I'm, uh, thank you. I'm happy to answer that question and then I'll make another maybe final point quickly because I know you want, we have a little time here. But uh, the short answer to your question is by spending more. Um, a lot of philanthropic institutions, including RBF, looked at this situation exactly as you have described it, um, a major public health crisis, but a crisis that also reveals the, the deficiencies in our democratic governance, the deficiencies in our uh, global public health uh, system, and even the deficiencies in capitalism itself. And so we are, as a foundation, accelerating our spending so that we can both be immediately responsive to the public health crisis, but also um, help people who are doing new thinking about how to reform these core systems of economics, public health, and democracy for these kinds of 21st century challenges. This pandemic is not going to be unique, unfortunately. We are going to face other kinds of crises, including a climate crisis, that will demonstrate exactly the same deficiencies if we don't address them now. And it really is a matter of reinventing these kind of core operating systems of society, governance, economics, and international relations. Because one other thing the pandemic demonstrated is global interdependence. We all count on each other for our well being. And unless we create systems that maximize our ability to count on each other, we're going to continue to see people suffering as they should not. Thank you very much. Um, both inspiring and scary. Uh, Mr. Koyevich, you have two minutes to make uh, some concluding remarks to respond to, to what we've heard and um, to give your last message, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm probably muted. No, I'm not. Okay. I, I actually wanted to just respond quickly to, to Ms. Ambassador Sattler, who I like very much, and I, and I have informal and formal meetings with him and everything. And he was talking about the money, and there was a lot of uh, talk about how money can help Bosnia. But I just want to remind you of something that's been going on, and like something that maybe should have been learned from the past. Bosnia had arrangements with IMF for a long time. And, you know, the arrangements with IMF usually go that you get a, one or two transactions, then you are supposed to do some reforms, and then you can get the rest of the money. Well, the, you see, the, what, the way the Bosnian government has been dealing with this issue so far is that they would take one, two, they would take tra transactions uh, to the point when the reforms were required, and then they would stop and they would not take the rest of the money. And we never finished any of the IMF uh, standby arrangements with, with the IMF. We withdrew only 40% of the money that was approved by IMF. And I, something like that could happen with this European uh, help. That, that's, well, anyway, I wanted to say, for, because we are talking about 25 uh, years of, uh, after Dayton, I actually can't believe I was, as a, as a Reuters journalist, I was in Dayton when this uh, agreement was signed, and I can't believe the time flew like that. But I really do believe that, uh, that, that I, I do believe that there is nothing, no stronger force that, than the idea whose time has come. And I do believe that this is a time when it's clear, I think, to most people, most players in this 
in, in, in international community and in, in, in Bosnian politics, that we outground Dayton, that we need to move Bosnia and Herzegovina from Dayton phase into the Brussels phase. And, and I would just be, I would be very pleased if European Union would not propose for us the rules that would be unacceptable in their own countries. And I think if, if the reforms that are waiting in Bosnia and Herzegovina are done on those principles, we'll be, uh, you, you'll be proud, you will be proud member of the European Union sooner than maybe some think. Thank you so much, Mr. Kravich, for bringing us from Dayton to the future in, in such a succinct way. Uh, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. And, and thank you very much to ECFR for and for, to Dr. Ruge for inviting me to, to get to speak with all of you. I just want to hand it back to Dr. Ruge to uh, make a summary and hopefully introduce uh, what we are going to see tomorrow, which I'm also looking very much looking forward to. Thank you so much. Thanks, Valerie. Um, and thank you, each one of you individually, um, our really fantastic, distinguished panelists for taking time away from your busy schedule, and especially Minister Zadic for joining us in your final months of pregnancy. Um, let me just give you two key takeaways uh, that I took from your panel. Um, the first one is, it looks like only women mute themselves. Um, and I think women in general need to learn how to unmute themselves more often. Uh, but on a more serious note, um, I loved the discussion and I think it is very important to discuss the impact of agents working bottom up and the governments who are able, if they want to, affect change top down and to create synergies between these different efforts. Um, we have two days to discuss these topics, which is great, uh, and we do not expect to solve issues and problems which have not been solved in 25 years in these two days. Neither do we pretend to, nor it's our job. Um, but what is our job and what we're trying to do here is to establish proper diagnosis of issues and problems based on the facts on the ground, rather than on some maybe outdated and distant notions of ethnic or religious incompatibility. And I just want to stress one more time that the reason why we have peace 25 years after Dayton is really despite Dayton and not because of it. It is because the society is resilient and because of all the different agents of change working together. So with that closing remark, um, I think we have in these two panels uh, identified both local agents of change as well as those from outside that can help them by just giving a little bit wind in their sails. Over to Anna. Thank you, Maida. Um, as Maida mentioned, uh, we don't expect to solve anything in these two days, but I think it's become clear, even just from this first day of this conference, that there are people who know what to do, and they do need support. And I'd really like to close by uh, repeating what Sabina Chudic said earlier today, when she said that if you're not going to support us, the progressives, at least, at the very least, don't support the nationalists. And before we close day one, I'd just like to mention a few notes um, for all of you joining us again tomorrow. Tomorrow we will start at 2.30 p.m. Berlin time. You can see our live stream on our website and also on Facebook Live. Um, stay engaged using, using the hashtags, hashtag ECFR events and hashtag Dayton25. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow when we are joined by President Bill Clinton, CNN's Christian Amanpour, and many, many more distinguished uh, speakers. It's almost embarrassing how many wonderful people we have joining us tomorrow. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you then. Have a good night. Hvala i laku noć.